I'm Lori Hawkinson, um, starting this off. And I wanted to have this image because I just think it's hysterical that he has this column in the center. Fantastic, beautiful photograph. Um, but we're going to see much more beauty here tonight. So before I introduce uh, tonight's program and guests, I'd like to say a few words about the amaz amazing individual for whom this memorial lecture honors. Paul Byard, this is the Paul Byard Memorial Lecture. Paul's innovative and re-envisioning of the discipline, his assembling of the absolute best people in the field to reinvent the work, his gift at teaching and unmatched contribution to the sometimes messy notion of historic preservation, while always insisting that whatever we do in the interest that it is, after all, both our civic duty, and that's really Paul, our civic duty, and that we have a wonderful time in the process. Uh, so to quote his Historic Preservation Program annual report, it sounds very dry. Um, it was actually the last report he wrote. It was part of a, a second book, which was uh, to be Why Save This Building, the Public Interest in Architectural Meaning. The thesis, the view of architecture, as a civic paradigm about human improvement from which we all, willy-nilly architects, amateurs, and ordinary citizens, powerfully and critically learn. This thesis is what's in it for all of us in architecture. This is the public interest in architectural meaning that ideally gives architecture its claim on all of us as human beings and gives it the remarkable legal power I have specifically tried to help us remember and exploit. So he was both a lawyer and an architect. So it's a very interesting combination to understand. So these words are a fitting introduction to tonight's event on the restoration and importantly, transformation of the former US Embassy in Oslo, originally designed by Eero Saarinen in 1959. As we know from Jorge's essay on the preservation of US embassies, public architecture after America's withdrawal, the federal government has been quietly selling off its valuable city-centered chancelleries. Many of them exemplary buildings of post-war modernism to the highest bidder. These chanceries not only house, which is really interesting, not just ambassadorial and consular offices, and we'll hear more about this, but also amazingly offered cultural services proposing free libraries uh, and screenings of US movies. So like it, they've been called little chunks of America. So tonight we'll learn more about this exemplary pro project and how existing buildings can be generative for design from several trajectories. So our distinguished uh, speakers tonight, Svein Lund, uh, who is a founding partner and chairman of Lund Hagem, partner in working both charge of the project together with Jonas Norstedt uh, of Atelier Oslo, and both have worked on several projects together, um, New National Library in front of the Opera House by Snow Hedda, and uh, the project we saw here in this room, I think back in the fall, the Mu Mu Museum by Juan Herreras. Uh, so really looking forward to seeing their collaboration here. We also have um, Eric Langdalen, who will be, he's, real, he's a preservation architect and a professor at the Oslo School of Architecture. Uh, he has an office that works on many adaptive reuse projects and is working currently on uh, the transformation of the old post office in Trondheim. So he and uh, Jorge Oteopayos, who will present uh, his work on the sculptures that are uh, from the US Embassy, have collaborated on a number of projects. They co-edited the influential book, also Experimental Preservation, along with uh, Thordis Ar Arnius, Arrhenius. They led a joint research team of GSAP and AHO, this is very important, faculty and students, uh, to participate in the international competition to preserve and modernize Oslo's government quarter. This collaborative work was the foundation for the book Fabula Piena by Brioni Roberts. They joined forces uh, as preservation architects in the team led by Lund Hagen and Atale Aslo, as I said, 
to preserve the former U.S. Embassy in Oslo. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Heidi Olufsen, the Norwegian Consul General uh, here in New York at the Royal Norwegian General Consulate to provide opening remarks to us. Heidi. Thank you very much. Um, really a privilege to welcome you all here at um, this gathering at Columbia University. My work as a diplomat is centered on strengthening the ties between the US and Norway. And much of this is accomplished by creating connections within the field of politics, business, culture, research, arts, and culture. And tonight, we are uh, embarking on a journey through the intersection of architecture, diplomacy, and cultural exchange as we explore the restoration of this amazing building, the former US Embassy in Oslo originally designed, as already said, by the visionary Finnish-American architect Eero Saarinen. And an embassy is not just any building, at least not for us diplomats. It's our home, the home of a foreign country's representation. When Norway establishes embassies, uh, great care is taken to ensure sensitivity uh, and a willingness to fit with the architectonic surroundings while defining an image of Norway, the Norway we wish the world to appreciate. Norwegian architecture, with its deep-rooted connection to nature, simplicity, and functionality has long been a source of inspiration both at home and abroad. From the dramatic landscapes of our fjords to the bustling streets of our cities, our architectural heritage reflects a delicate balance between tradition and innovation. And it is within this context that we must recognize the contribution of Norwegian architects and designers who have left an incredible mark on the global landscape. One such architect is Sveide Fehn, whose work paved the way for unique Norwegian design that delicately integrate with the natural world. He famously stated that building is a brutal confrontation of culture on nature, and in that confrontation you can find balance and beauty. In recent years, the capital of Norway, Oslo, has undergone a transformation with bold architectural projects reshaping the city and its waterfront, using a sustainable approach, uh, including utilizing recycled materials and creating carbon neutral urban areas. And we have seen these companies, Lundhagen Architecture and Atelier Oslo, known for their environmentally friendly and innovative design, playing a pivotal role in this evolution. Uh, their work includes the iconic Dijkman Library near the Snøhette designed Oslo Opera House, which is located to the new National Museum of Norway and the Monk, new Monk Museum. And all these buildings uh, stand as a testament to the city's commitment to architectural excellence, sustainability, and low emissions. And as diplomats, we uh, often bring delegations from the US to Norway within the field of culture, business, green transition, uh, other fields, politicians. And we're so proud when we can take them to show them this uh, waterfront and the new museum buildings of Oslo with very low carbon emission with the um, the saunas in between in the fjords, uh, that's really something that uh, amazes people. And uh, I know that next time I go to Norway with a delegation, this will still be part of the plan because I've been there many times, but only when it was an embassy. And I've seen pictures on how that is now available for all of us. So that's really amazing. The dialogue between Norway and the US uh, is not confined to diplomatic channels alone. Cultural exchanges continue to strengthen their bonds of friendship and cooperation. From um, Snøhetta, the Norwegian architect firm, Snøhetta's design of the National September 11th Memorial and Museum here in New York City, to the restoration of the former US Embassy in Oslo by our esteemed guests, and of which we will hear a lot more soon. There is a tangible expression of this enduring partnership with our most important ally, and it reflects our shared values and commitment to excellence. 
As we reflect on the parallels between Norway and American architecture, we must also acknowledge the broader trends shaping the landscape. New York City, the cultural capital of the world, is a testament to the grandness of American architecture with its skyline dotted with iconic structures that speak volumes about the country's architectural prowess. Tonight, we have the privilege of hearing from just a few of Norway's esteemed architects and scholars who have dedicated their careers to the preservation and celebration of architectural heritage. And I'm delighted to introduce Sven Lund, founding partner and chairman of Lundhagen Architects, whose commitment to simplicity, minimalism, and functionality has shaped architectural projects both in Norway and abroad. I also would like to extend my deepest gratitude to Columbia University for hosting this important discussion and to our distinguished speakers, including Jonas Norsted um, of Atelier Oslo, uh, Erik Langdal of the Oslo School of Architecture and Design, and Jorge Otero Ailos of Columbia University uh, for sharing your experience and insights. So let's embark on this journey uh, together as we explore the rich tapestry of history, culture, and design embodied in the restoration of this iconic embassy. Thank you. A lot of, of a background together uh, goes back to, well, we started working together in 2005 and we won this international competition about the library in 2009. And uh, it was finished in just before the pandemic in 2021. Um, it's already said, it's next to the Oprah, part of the new harbor scene in Oslo. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a very different library than we have been to see today here in Colombia. It's it's a, it's a, it's a new kind of library which is very open. Uh, it's not a silent library. Uh, it has three thousand uh, um, people visiting a day, and it's uh, open through five stories. Uh, the most um, visible feature in the library is that there is sight lines going from the top down to the pavement or the other way around and the the same lines bringing light into the building which even if it's a quite deep building it, it's it's very light throughout the building here we're standing outside the facade and looking up through one of these axes. Um, the two offices are a bit different. Um, Lundhagen is a bit bigger office. We are about 60 people. Uh, and we are known for working very much in landscape situations while uh, uh, but Leuslo and Jonas is, have been working very much with preservation. Uh, here is an example of uh, 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 we call it hytte in Norway. You would call it a uh, summer house, I would say. Uh, it's a summer house uh, made with a concrete floating um, uh, roof. Um, it's in the southern part of Norway. Uh, when I'm abroad, I am often get asked, why can you build so near to the water uh, still? But the answer is that you can't do it. It's, it's forbidden to build by the water today. You have to move at least 100 meters away. But if you have an old cabin you can take away, then it's allowed to build so far. It, may be not the same in the future. There's a big discussion going on. This is a very tiny uh, example of the same thing. We, we really very much like to work very closely into the landscape. Uh, this is an example of uh, Atlea Oslo's work. 
It's an old industrial building, which is turned into a house for journalists in the center of Oslo. And uh, this is an old bank, which is turned into a culture house, also in the center of Oslo. For those of you who have been in Oslo, you know that the embassy is here. This is the castle. The library and the opera is down here. And um, this triangle building by Sidin you see it's not following the building lines of the uh, housing around that we will look at later. He recessed the building and made space for trees around the building. The building was sold from the uh, American embassy to a private developer in 2016, and we were invited to a competition with five different Norwegian teams, which we won that competition. Um, and what is very interesting about the embassy is that um, it lies on a new sort of cultural street or line in Oslo. A lot of the cult cultural institutions, which before was inside the city, has moved down to the um, moved down to the sea. It starts up here with uh, Dijkman, the new library. We have the opera, the Munch Museum, and the new National Museum by Schuwark and the Playhouse. Um, Herreros made the uh, new Munch Museum. Uh, and the famous uh, Rathaus, the Rådhus by Arneberg and Paulson, which is also worth seeing. And on this line, we then find the embassy. So, I would say that going to Oslo, as as you mentioned, there there is there is really a lot to see. All these building I mentioned now has come after 2008, so it's quite remarkable for a quite small city as Oslo to put up that many buildings in such a short time. Here we see them, the Lambda, the Opera, the Dijkman, the uh, Rådehuse, National Museum, and then the Embassy. It says 220, but that's when we started rehabilitating it. The competition was in 2017. Uh, when we arrived at the site, um, it was very far from how it was when Sardin left it in 1959-60. It was really closed off by this fence going around the building. Uh, the whole entrance and there were buildings here which was all part of the security which started in the 90s. But after 9-11 uh, in 2001, it, it really was a really closed building. And um, it was not a part of the cityscape anymore. It's a technical room we see at the top coming up here. This is from the... Uh, uh, southern part, and we see 
how this was a part or how it was not a part of the cityscape. It was used for parking for the people who worked in the embassy. Georgi will talk more about the fence later, so I will not concentrate on the fence. Uh, when we did the competition, uh, we thought uh, that we were quite free to do uh, more than we actually managed in the end. And that was because the building is actually list all the facades are listed. Uh, a big part of the interiors are listed. And even this uh, first floor are listed. Uh, we thought we could sort of do something uh, in this part of the site and on the top, uh, because this part of the site was never built as Sarin really saw it. It, it, it was never developed. Uh, uh, rumor says that also that Sarin really didn't know that the site was that steep. I, I don't know that if that's true or not, but, but uh, that part of the site was, was, was really never finished. Um, here we made an entrance to a conference center going down. Uh, the conservation authorities, after long discussions, said that it was not possible to do. We, we could not excavate like this. We had to enter this building more or less on, on this um, uh, level. We will see later how this developed and, and how we solved this problem. This is a um, sketch from the uh, competition where we thought that the technical room at the top should be replaced by a public space so people could come up and see uh, this part of Oslo. It's, it's a neighbor to the castle. Uh, and there is also very nice views over the Oslo Fjord. Here we see the embassy and the new National Museum down here. Uh, a lot of things are happening in this part of uh, Oslo these days. And um, Here we see clearly that the embassy is not following the building lines of, of these blocks. Uh, he made space for these trees. They were planted, but they never grew up because of the fence uh, coming. And uh, our plan now is to get the same uh, placement of the trees as Sardin drew them in 1959. Uh, we went on a study trip to uh, London. Uh, Jürgen was a part of that. And uh, actually, he did exactly the same in London. He uh, took the, retracted the uh, building from the other buildings around, and he planted uh, Platan trees, uh, and I think it was two reasons for that. It was for the people in the embassy wanted to look out on to the green, and also looking at the embassy from outside um, to 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 make it a bit more private. Um, he also said that he wanted to include the site as being a part of Schlotzparken, the big park around the castle. Um, this is just a drawing from the, from the competition again. Uh, in the end, we managed to, after long discussions, uh, Jonas will talk more about that. I think we had meetings with the uh, conservation authorities. 
every two weeks for three years or four years. And uh, this facade, which never was very nice, uh, it was really closed. We managed to double most of the windows so we could get light into the building. to restaurant cafes. Uh, here we see the um, facade. Sardin tried to get it as a stone facade, but it ended up being a, a prefabricated concrete facade with stones from uh, a local brud, um, um, Jonas, quarry in Larvik, not far from Oslo. Um, Eric will tell us about the restoration, which went on for a long time, uh, because the Americans really had done not enough to, while they were there, it was going not only on the exterior, but also the interior was, was quite neglected for a long time. Uh, it's a beautiful facade, and it changes very much with the different sunlight and the light during the day. This is an original uh, picture from 1960. This is also an original picture from the 1960. And we can notice that there is high, nice doors here, and you can go straight into the building, and you meet some stairs inside. Um, shortly about this canopy, which was drawn by his assistant at the time, Cesar Pelli. He was a student. And here we are looking up to, up onto the building. This was how it looked when we arrived. Uh, uh, they build uh, stairs outside, and uh, they build a new ramp coming up on the side, and they changed the doors because of security. And it all looked very different from when Sarin left it. Now we have uh, managed to get it really back to how it was and even improved it because we have also managed to make it a universal building and it's accessible for everybody. This is a picture from after the renovation. This is the corner, how, how it sits on the corner. This was when we arrived and when we left. Especially the, the proportions of the entrance was, was really uh, a, a big improvement when we finished it. And here we see the um, way we solved the universal axis, so it's it's almost not visible, and you can. And and it uh, it's, it's it's a solution which works perfect. So then we are into the building, and I, I think Jonas will take us through uh, the uh, real transformation and all the technical um, difficulties which followed. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you again to Jorge and the rest of the faculty for inviting us and letting us sharing this uh, great, uh, great uh, work that we have be been going through. Uh, <coughs> the building was so closed, so it was a kind of myth in Oslo. Everybody wanted to visit this building, but no one, or at least very, very few, were allowed to enter. This is a scan uh, that we did before the renovation, and 
in everybody's mind this was a masterpiece but but uh it was literally kind of almost a modern ruin uh this was the interior uh of the building when we started suspended ceilings carpets uh walls that was broken pro proportions that were kind of altered uh the materiality had had uh, was really lost the windows were sealed um and basically a lot of the reason for this was all the technical equipment that were out of date from from when it uh, was built and and that had kind of changed the whole kind of geometry and 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 the interior of the building but we had this fantastic archive that also eric will speak more about later that showed us that this used to be a building with fantastic interior furnitures uh ambience uh look at this great woman sitting with a cigarette and even a public library that was open for everybody to visit and it was really really a great building uh when we look at this top, we see, as Sven mentioned, this technical rooms on the top. Uh, and they were really, really filled up with technical equ equipment out of date. And this was quite early. It, it turned out for us that this was the kind of key element that we needed to work with in order to kind of be able to renovate and get back the the the, the kind of character of the building just some photos and also the view from this terrace here you have the view towards the castle is really amazing towards the sea is also fantastic so it was a great potential um yeah and and Again, as Sven um, just mentioned, we had this idea to, to kind of dig under the building, but the preservation authorities, they were really, really, really uh, kind of uh, against that idea. And the reason for that uh, was that the building, the, it's actually consists of very, very... Um, um, uh, small kind of elements and it's extremely fragile uh, so if you start to, to dig under the building the preservation authorities were extremely afraid that uh, this building will start to craculate and start to kind of deform but we had this super super good german engineers that helped us with this system that you could actually make a secondary structure temporary structure and then start to dig out the floor plate and replace the the, the structure with the uh, uh, new structure and actually kind of create a level under the building in order to 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 get uh, more space but also technical equipment here you see um, the elements of the facade and how it's mounted during the building site. And this is a section that shows the new system that we developed. It's the the main idea is that the the facade is so uh, uh it's so kind of uniform and we didn't we could not place any new elements um in the facade. The top is too small to 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 kind of room all the new equipment. So the new idea is to place all the new technical elements under the building to dig out the basement under the building and get the air from the outside, not the building facade, but from the outside and into the building and up up. So. After long, long discussions, uh, the the authorities uh, gave us permission to to start to dig down 
in order to 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 get this new technical space and it was the most uh uh scary uh building process we have ever been through with this uh heritage building just basically standing on poles for one and a half year it they digged and digged and digged and here you see this kind of listed sarin and rooms just hanging in the air um, and we digged almost 15 meters down here you see also the project leader he starts to be very happy because he understands it's actually will go well and here you see the temporary st structure uh being replaced with a with a new structure and a new wall going outside the building so this is the basement new basement with a new two new air intakes on the side here is how it looks today with the new air intakes and there here the whole ventilation system the the air comes in into the building like this and it also gives the light to the the new underground place here from the outside and here we added a new exit from that space it looks like this today and this is the stairway going down to the exit and here you see the new ventilation the air intake for the whole building and a new facade and further up uh, we also had to develop a system in order to keep the proportion of the old rooms the ceiling height because as you saw in the pictures uh, the the ventilation it 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 kind of normally uh, builds a lot more than actually we had available. So in, we invented this system where we have all all the kind of horizontal ducts going in one part, and then we just have a big chamber of air. So the the air is blown into a chamber where it kind of just diffuses through the new ceiling. So it's a very it's a really really nice system of uh, distributing the air uh, in order to create a system we also had to alter the plants somehow this is the the former plants of Sarinen where you had the corridor and then just small offices we made this technical uh, layer uh, horizontal layer and then open up the corners in order to to be able to distribute the air and then we have a system where these walls are flexible so in the future you could also change change how the layout of the plants works so here you see the the technical grid yeah and this technical zone this is the office space uh, when it was uh, stripped down and I'm going to show you how it's kind of re, re made with all these chambers. And here, these chambers are then filled with air, and the air just comes out through the ceiling itself. And here you see some images that for us are funny to show. It just shows the distribution of all the technical equipment in the building that is totally invisible today where you see all the new heavy machines they are put down in the new basement while on top there is just these small uh, elements and then what is also very interesting is that we use the building the geometry of the building for the um, for the used air so the air goes through the ceiling and here you see some of the interiors uh, how it's how it's uh, re been rebuilt 
So the air goes through the interiors out through these kind of um, filters, through the doors, over the doors, and into this big atrium that used to look like this, but now looks like this. It's totally restored. Uh, all the old doors are, are kind of taken back. And, and the air is kind of sucked up in the top of the building. Here you see also this kind of air system. So this is the roof and here is the a small ventilation uh, machine on top here that kind of drags the air out in order to manage to get this, create this fantastic situation. And then Sven will continue a little bit with the, with the, some stories about the wood material used in the building. Well, I read in the paper that it had opened when we were in New York. So we have not visited the, the building with the roof terrace open. We can do that next week. Um, and there is space for 300 people sitting outside. And... Um, really a big part of this project is to open this house for the public because in the 60s it big part of the building was open to the public there was a cinema underneath with american films there was a library you could go and read american literature and you could go and see american art and uh, i think people used it a lot but that stopped I don't know when it stopped, but it was perhaps working as intended for 10 to 15 years before the security came and made that impossible. So today the building is used as uh, an office building for a private company. Uh, we did try in the um, competition as well to see if it's possible to do other use. Some people tried to make it into a hotel because of the listed building, we could not put bathroom into the building. So in fact, it was not possible to use the building for any other purpose than offices. But on um, um, the lower ground floor, there is a new restaurant and um, the atrium is open to the public and uh, where you applied for the visum in the old days there is a new cafe and on the top there is also a new restaurant so uh, going there it 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 feels like a quite open building um, this is the library to the left when we arrived and to the right the black and white picture is is as it was uh, at the same time as we did this building, uh, you probably know that there was an incident in Oslo in 2011 where a lot of people got killed. Um, the Regeringskvartalet was blown up. And um, there is a historic connection here because um, the architect called Eng, which worked with Kosmo, who did this building. He designed this building. Looks a bit like the UN building in Paris, if you know that. And there, I think we discussed this building for 10, 15 years, and it ended up that it was torn down in three years ago after a long, long debate, and there were really physical fights going on, on the street. And most architects were fighting to keep it. Uh, we lost that battle, but I actually called the uh, responsible people in the government and said, what happens to the interiors? Is there any possibility that we could uh, we needed teak to restore the embassy. And we actually got four containers with teak. Uh, 
uh, both from this building, which was which was not there anymore, but also from this building, which looked like this. And they are not reusing the teak in this building, and we we could not. But you can't you can't go to the shop to buy teak these days. So that was a really a, 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 a good incident. This is from Ublocka. And this is how we used it to repair. And we made also new doors and a lot of new interiors with those with the teak from the containers. So it's, it's, it's a very meaningful reuse. This is a sketch from Edo Sidin from the, I mentioned the cafe. At, uh, this is where you went in to uh, apply for a visum going to America. Looked like this in 2016 when they left. Um, we tried to take down this wall to open up into the cafe, but the uh, conservation authorities, authorities uh, said that we had to keep these um, openings. They were not, they were not as you saw in the uh, drawing, science drawing. They were they were not original, but they had to be kept as a part of the history. And today. You can see the size of the openings are the same as before. Uh, we also um, uh, had a little art program. Uh, it's not finished, but uh, the only thing we have in place now is this piece here. It's done by an uh, Australian art. Uh, Artist called Gina Giorgetti. You see here. She's a painter, and this is done, made into a mosaic, made in Venice. Um, perhaps you, Yogi, can tell me what this is. It says here that it's a work for a new New York subway station. You know which? No. Um, This is the cafe with the artwork with existing corner marble done by Sarin. Uh, the mother of uh, Sarin, she made this carpet. It's called the Kiss, and this was sort of included in the new artwork by the artist. Let's see her name. This is a photo from uh, the uh, new restaurant at the top. Uh, canteen was at floor, the floor under the main floor with the narrow windows. Um, and we found these uh, archive photos and we found that there was before very nice lamps made by um, Hadland Glasswerk, which is famous for making glass in Norway. And we managed to make new lamps by the same manufacturer. And this is how it looks today. And here we see also the new double doors. The openings were 50% of what they are now. And this is what we call the 
outside in the room. It's the old cinema. This is a listed ceiling. And here is where we dug 12 meter down, 15. And this is the same, this is the same room with this ceiling from 1959. I think I'm getting to the end. Um, Sardin said uh, he looked upon the building as, uh, you know this uh, citat better than me, uh, looked at the building as a black and white building, dressed as you should do when you re represented your country, right? Something like that. So that's all about the embassy. One picture more. Um, if you combine the knowledge about the uh, library and you combine it with uh, uh, some experience with conservation, it ended up that we won the competition about uh, the new library in Rotterdam. So that's actually when we go home tomorrow. This is on our uh, drawing board or more on the screen, perhaps. Um, it's done by Bakema in the uh, 60s. And uh, it's an, a quite iconic building. They say in Holland, we, we are quite uncertain about this. They want to keep uh, a lot of the building, but we are actually are going to strip the building all the way back to just keeping the po the um, the columns and the um, concrete uh, slabs, and then we start all over again, and with new additions and uh, completely new interiors. This will be finished in a couple of years. So that could be the next lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, then Svein called me uh, back when they were doing or invited to the competition. Um, I was, of course, thrilled by the, the possibility, but I immediately uh, called Jorge. So he was the, um, the partner in crime, uh, taking care of what we can call the hardcore preservation initiative in this building. So we, um, through the process of the competition, but also through the, <coughs> the whole process of uh, this restoration project, we had the role of digging up the archives. That was quite um, immense, uh, both in uh, in Norway and also in at CCA, also in uh, at Yale, of course, with the Sarin archive. <clears throat> so we followed the process uh, with the uh, city antiquarians. We were uh, part of the kind of discussion around this uh, building, and particularly we were given the responsibility of restoration of the facade. So this is what I will talk about mainly. It's going to be very nerdy. I'll just warn you a little bit about that. Um, this is uh, the context where we should understand the building. So I will not talk uh, briefly about that, but uh, you have a, a colleague here at uh, GSAP that really has a new book that this is taken from. Uh, so this is a fantastic... Uh, David is here, is it? David Peterson? Yeah, fantastic. This is this is so great. So this study was made by, by him and also participating students at the GSAP. But the idea of this new image of uh, the American embassies around the world after World War II and the, war, and the Cold War period, that where the Americans commissioned uh, modernist architects to give this new look of of uh, architects and uh, of, of the embassies and as Swain also showed the uh, London embassy was uh, was also given to Sarnen and we believe he was selected because he was a sort of a giving of the, the corporate architecture of, of uh, United States um, a new uh, interpretation so this idea of the embassy as sort of a pro 
propaganda vehicle or a, a place where the American values would be uh, disseminated through architecture is, it stands kind of a, uh, as a hypothesis in, in our work. And the London Embassy, as you will see, is, is sort of conceived in the same time. So very, uh, very, very similarly think th uh, thinking through the facade, uh, also a prefabricated uh, factory made system. Uh, also having a feature or like also facing the park um, uh, as the Norwegian embassy and also having this very particular way of meeting the ground. So the idea of, uh, and also looking into Saarinen's, uh, some of the Saarinen's other words, the GM technical center, you see kind of the same idea of, of, of uh, dealing with the, with the relationship between the facade and the, and, and the, the square in front. So both this, this, uh, this sort of negotiation with the ground and the canopy. So uh, looking into this uh, particular embassy, you need also to understand uh, the context where this is sitting. I will repeat uh, what Svein already said, but the, the park, the Royal Park, the center of Oslo, where the important institutions circles around the, the park. So this idea of, of placing the embassy in the midst of the center, having this face to, towards the, the, the park. This was a project funded by the Norwegian government because this was sort of the payback for the Marshall plan, for the Marshall help. So the Norwegian gave uh, the Americans the most prominent site. They were actually negotiating uh, also where the foreign ministry uh, lays today. They were negotiating the site. Um, the Norwegian paid for the whole embassy, but they selected uh, an American embassy, uh, an American architect to, to draw this. Uh, already mentioned Jon Eng, that was on the front page. Uh, he was the local, he had worked in the United States and he became kind of the associate architect very importantly in, in Norway. So he did the working drawings, he, he sort of con conducted the, the kind of the important uh, building. This embassy is really almost a two-dimensional uh, facade. So it's really about uh, this very prominent uh, road and this prominent uh, facing the park. Uh, we also believe this selection of this combination of concrete, black concrete, colored concrete, with a very dense content of Labradorite, uh, this Ladvi kit that we call it in Norway, this black uh, sparkling uh, stone that we also find in the North Americas. So you might, uh, we, we don't have clues for that, but we think that this sort of idea of the materiality being also a part of a kind of a cross-Atlantic uh, collaboration. So this uh, idea of a black building with white uh, windows, white tie, as uh, uh, Sign says, gives this uh, very prominent, very, very um, sophisticated uh, facade. And as you see, this side entrance is the US Information Service entrance almost sits on the street. So it's, it's really about this uh, street. And then the consular uh, entrance also sits on, this, uh, on the other side. Um. This will work. So this first um, had a work we did was uh, very important in, of course, in all preservation project is really to get the um, assembly of all the archival uh, documents you can find. And in this case, we found an enormous amount of, of information. The, of course, the um, Americans themselves, the embassy had working drawings, they had photographs from, from the building process, as, as you've seen. Um, you went to the CCA and the, and the Yale archive, where we find the kind of very, very, very well documented. The only building that was not sort of, uh, the only uh, drawings we didn't really find was the working drawings. They were thrown out uh, by the wife of his colleague, this Norwegian architect. But the idea of, of and this, this archive was, uh, was a way of this digital archive, this sort of tool, made us um, kind of disseminate to, to actually handle all these documents in, in one, one uh, format, uh, giving the architects the possibility of finding historic drawings, uh, the engineers, uh, the clients, 
and also even the builders they went with their phone and looked looked at this archive while 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 working uh, this is of course an, an enormous problem in, in 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 these processes that where do you find these drawings at cca uh, we found early sketches uh, where you could see sarnen works almost like a classical facade uh, kind of the closed, uh, very much more closed than, than we see today. Also, um, very dealing also with many of these features that you could see in the London embassy. Um, many studies of kind of how the meeting meets the ground, how it meets the, the sky, and sort of ending up with, with something that looks uh, almost like today. We working with the ground, different versions of how to, to kind of give an expression of that. And of course, this dilemma working with this slope, uh, having to lift the building on top of something, which is, of course, difficult. Uh, working with, with um, more massive stone, um, different types of kind of expressions of facades. Very different from what, what's here today getting closer to something that ended up in this very particular um, um, design that we will see more in detail. So this is, I guess, the, almost the final sketch of, of how it looks today and the uh, design development drawings. So this idea of this black uh, representative facade facing the Royal Park inviting people in uh, really makes this building uh, uh, kind of a prominent, um, uh, this facade a prominent feature in the city. So it's really communicating with the city, not only through materials, but also through the visuals, through the kind of transparency. And you could sense here that there's a great deal of will to look into the facades. So you're actually looking into the offices of, of the, the ambassadors. Browsing through um, the Yale archive, uh, Jorge and his students also found kind of a lot of, of uh, Sarnen's um, research. So the trade magazines, the, the technical um, uh, the window deliveries, the German uh, kind of all kinds of deliveries um, and producers around the world. So he was very much interested in, in getting and being uh, at the edge of, of what was happening. What's really interesting, uh, as seen in light of today's embassies, the new Norwegian embassy that was, I will not show pictures of uh, for, for good reasons, but that's uh, an entirely American produced embassy. So they ship from uh, the US, they ship containers with everything. So, so uh, of course, not concrete, but all the door handles, everything that is sort of sits, uh, the fittings, the furniture, the materials, everything is shipped in containers because of security. But this building was really a Norwegian project. So he, even though he imported new technology, he um, sort of an, engaged a whole uh, system of producers and hand uh, craftsmen ships. So this uh, is also revealing, and we should have looked, uh, it's really interesting to look into this because I think this embassy also could have produced new knowledge for, for the local uh, producers. Looking a little closer on the, on, the, uh, on the facade and the structural drawings that we were very lucky to find, you could see these frames. I will get back to them. And the idea that you have um, a facade consisting very importantly of a layer of black concrete, thin layer, I think it's six centimeters thick, and then you have a normal concrete inside. So you have like this double layer. And of course, this black concrete was probably expensive and also has a different um, kind of um, property than the other ones. And we could also see, and very importantly for the engineer, the new engineer, that he could actually look into the formwork drawings and, and, and the reinforcement, the steel drawings. And you could also see um, that the, the, the steel inside is a, is a very shallow um, concrete as um, cover of, of the facade that also created a lot of problems through times. The whole facade was produced uh, just outside Oslo um, by this um, Interbyg. Uh, so they produced the, all the elements. Um, 
the concrete pil uh, pillars. They grinded it on site by hand and also by machine. They made a whole factory almost like a production line for this embassy. They assembled these pieces, so the columns and the tops and the bottoms was assembled and, and, and sort of um, fastened on site. And the frames were installed in the factory and transported to the site and lifted up uh, on each floor. So you would build up the first slab, you would erect these um, frames. Then you would build and, then, and connect with the new slab, connect the cores of the building to the facade. And then you would do the, the following. So this turned out to be an extremely rigid facade. It's, it's very rigid. It's not, uh, it's not what the preservation authorities thought that it was would kind of be a, a big, uh, uh, not rigid, but it's, it's, it's a very rigid construction when it comes to it. So the, the frames, and then you have these pieces connecting in between that is set back. And then finally the, the fillers, the joints, uh, sort of closing up the, the in-betweens. And then finally treating the whole of his facade with teak oil. So he, they were rubbing teak uh, oil. We maybe think they just took the teak oil from inside from the, from the teak uh, furnishing and tried it outside, but this gives, of course, a very beautiful uh, shine to the building. And gives us an amazing facade. So looking at these uh, photographs, and even, of course, today, they're almost the same, the uh, tolerance of this is three millimeters. So there's extremely little tolerance for this, this facade. And you get almost like a paper-thin feeling it's very transparent and it and and the and the, um, uh, the way it's it's um, formed gives us this feeling of of almost uh, kind of a something uh, in thin air two time there has been some alterations uh, they had to put in a acs uh, air conditioners so this uh, sarin and also this sign kind of the way to put in the air conditioners not very nice they were Doing in the 90s, uh, the, 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 these reports really shows that the building had suffered from, from damages, quite a lot of damages already then, and they did a huge repair uh, in the 90s, late 90s. Uh, we have um, an eyewitness just two years after the inauguration of the, the building that the beautiful black facade of Saarinen looked really gray. So this teak oil treatment really didn't prove to be sufficient for keeping this uh, kind of in the long term. After 9-11, uh, drastic measures was done in the building, not uh, like reinforcement of steel, new doors, etc., etc. So this was the proposal um, with the uh, American architects, uh, uh, David Brody Bond, who uh, proposed to, to install steel frames, so to remove the windows and install steel frames, reinforcing the whole facade. Luckily, that didn't happen, because then I don't think the building would have been preserved. The listing is really putting the facade on the top of the hierarchy. And we, through our statement of significance, really pointed to the fact that this building, this the facade is important. We, we need to, to bring it back to the kind of 1959 glory. At the first glimpse, the facade looked pretty OK. Um, but on a, on a closer look, it was really suffering from a lot of problems. Uh, of course, you can see the, gr the gray, uh, the grayness. And very interestingly, the, or naturally the facade had suffered from weathering so it's especially the, the facades that was facing the, the, the sea the paste of the of the uh, concrete has had diminished so the the facade that was very smooth and shiny now turned out to be kind of a very weathered uh, uh, facade these are just some of the i will not go in detail but these are the sort of really um serious problems we were facing by when we investigated the, the, the facade. The flaking of they had used some new uh, surface treatment, so the whole facade was flaking like uh, dandruff. 
there was chalk stains uh, proving that the water was kind of pushed through the facade, so it was leaking and pushed through very critically. There was a lot of corrosion, basically rust coming out of the building, so you, we can prove that there's kind of corrosion inside the, uh, the, the facade. Carbonation uh, and also high chloride content, so salt, uh, which is, of course, the worst thing you can experience in a concrete facade because that starts to corrode the, uh, the building. There were a lot of cracks uh, where water was penetrating. Uh, parts of the, the concrete was porous, so also leaving uh, water inside. Uh, and there were loose pieces, so things like pieces was falling off the building. So, so it was very dangerous when we, we showed up at the building. Uh, all the sealants, all the, the sealers was, was, uh, was not functioning, so of course water would, would, would penetrate. And these in-between elements uh, were at some point pushed out, so the, kind of the whole facade start, has started to, to, to move because of the water. Part, uh, and after spending years of investigating this facade, we sort of found the reason why this has happened. Um, a part of it is, of course, the concrete itself and the maintenance, but part is actually the, the windows that didn't really let the water out, but they actually let the water inside the building. So the water in kind of had penetrated the, the facade a few times. And then we learned uh, this uh, in the same um, magazine that published the building in 1950 or 1960. We learned that they were so proud of putting salt in the mix of facade, in the mix of the concrete, to accelerate the process in the winter. So this was, of course, um, a, a catastrophe. What was very interesting, and at this point, uh, or at a point in the process, um, we thought this was kind of a lost case, and the engineer even said maybe we have to tear down the whole facade and rebuild it and make a copy. Um, the client was kind of very, uh, he was following the process very carefully. And of course, if you want to have a perfect result, uh, you have to work and you have to demolish and you have to move and remove um, a lot of the concrete and replace, the, replace it, which would destroy the facade. So the client very wisely decided to do the necessary, uh, what was here, to, what was there to, uh, at that time and then return to the facade gradually through the time. So this kind of idea of not making a perfect restoration, but keeping on doing maintenance and repair through time. So that, that was a very interesting, very important decision. So we made tests um, uh, this const like months and months doing all kinds of tests, how to actually take into, you know, when you have to remove uh, concrete, you do a square um, replacement, or do you do a kind of round? Uh, how do you build scaffolding? Now, how do you do a formwork for something that was originally casted on uh, horizontally? How do you get the concrete filled in in these columns uh, with the aggregates not sinking in the, the bottom? Um, treating the um, trying to treat the damages that was more cosmetic or more kind of in the middle of it. Um, elements, looking into the match of the concrete, which of course you need to match the paste and you have to match the stone. And of course we found the quarry, we found the stone, but then how do you match something that has weather all the time? So these dilemmas keep coming uh, and coming. Um, matching, not so very successful matching, more successful matching of the concrete, and, and the formwork, um, and then finally trying to find the strategy that because we we had an idea of this black facade, uh, this shiny facade, so deciding uh, that first how to clean it, how to get it back to to, um, to former glory, maybe we could fill it, uh, that the cleaning, different cleaning techniques. Should we really fill in the, the weathering, which was, course, was, was of course also really difficult since it's weathered differently, but ending up with grinding down the whole facade. So 
replicating the process that they did in 1959. Uh, I think 15 people or a lot of people with handheld machines grinded down the whole facade, two, three, up to five millimeters, uh, in the process of, of uh, three, four months, uh, removing all the weathering and removing all the traces of time, which is something really against kind of the, no the normal preservation theories. So this immense work, grinding, f and then eventually finding the residue uh, color, replacing the teak all with something else, and ending up uh, with something that is not pitch black. Uh, the client is a little bit uh, disappointed, I think. But we are uh, now, um, through this process, we were able to seal the building, repair the most damaged part, uh, and actually almost give it back to what it was um, at that time. Very beautiful. You could still see the repair, so I think we're happy to have this sort of traces of this repair that has happened. Um, but I think it's turned out pretty well. Thank you. Well, um, such a delight that you're all here. Thank you very much. I'm going to tell you a little bit about analog sites. Uh, it was such a pleasure to be part of this team. I have to say I was humbled by uh, them, uh, the amazing work that, that they did. And I, w I played a small part in it. And I'm very happy to share uh, some of my work uh, in it. Um, apart with, from collaborating on, with, uh, on some of the technical questions, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about these sculptures that are on Park Avenue now, uh, why they're there, why I made them, uh, and um, <clears throat> where they come from. They come from the facade. They come from the fence around the U.S. Embassy. So as you know, the, we've seen it in the photographs. The embassy had this fence around it for many years. It didn't originally when it was designed by Aero Saarinen. So um, the embassy was very open, as we've heard, had a public art gallery, it had a public theater, it had a public library. So n nothing like an embassy today. <laughs> we don't build embassies this way anymore. Uh, and this project for me really goes back, and it's very dear to my heart to be speaking at, at the Bayard Memorial Lecture because Bayard, uh, we call them Brother Bayard, uh, and he really was somebody that brought me to Colombia and that taught me a lot of what I know and who started the joint studio between preservation and architecture and who, when he passed away, I was fortunate enough to inherit that joint studio and I've been co-teaching it with a number of dear colleagues, Mark Rakatansky, who's in the room, uh, also Craig Connick, and Ten years ago, we started getting interested in these U.S. embassies and how they were being decommissioned. And so together with students, one of the first projects we did was to go to the U.S. embassy in Norway and try to imagine what could be done with it. And so here we are uh, touring while well, it was still an embassy inside the embassy. And now uh, it's very gratifying that ten years later, uh, here we are um, you know, on the cover of Architectural Record. And of course, when we started working on this project, we soon realized that this was part of a, of a network. And I really owe it, I'm gonna do another plug, shameless plug for David Peterson's book, which everyone should come and look at and buy. Um, uh, David uh, was at Columbia, was doing this research uh, as a, a preservation student and did this and then ended up taking his thesis and turning it into this amazing book. We soon realized that this was part of a network, that this was a network of U.S. embassies. This is his work looking at all the ones that have been decommissioned. And, you know, it was very clear that this network, that was a cultural network, it was a way of getting America's best foot, best foot forward during the Cold War, was being dismantled. And so we were witnessing the, the end of an era. And we didn't have enough historical distance to really know what we were gonna need from, from that era that we're leaving behind in order to make sense in the future of the past. Will we need this microphone? Uh, will we need this? Uh, this is 
the safe, the door that led to the secret communications room inside the embassy. Uh, how do we make these decisions? What, what are we going to need? So part of what my involvement was is to think about this fence. The fence that we were told by the Norwegian authorities had to be removed and seemed to me extremely important as a fence to keep, but we had no real way to save it. Um, so we talked to the new owner of the embassy and he kindly agreed to donate the embassy to us. Um, and so together with my partner, Laurence Lafour, we were trying to think about what are we gonna do over here? And uh, of course the fence is the first act of preservation, but here we are now we have tons and tons of solid steel fence in our hands and we have to figure out what to do with it. But it seemed important just because it is a form of preservation. But not only that, it was designed by Davis Brody Bond. And we know that Max Bond was the chair of the architecture program in our school from 1968 to 1983. So this is a GSAB story. Our former chair of architecture designed the fence before he died. He died in 2009. So this was one of his last projects and he was the only African-American uh, uh, chair of architecture until Mario Gooden uh, just became chair again recently. So <clears throat> there were a lot of other people involved in this project, and not to forget Florence Knoll, who did all the furniture inside, and Harry Bertoya, the sculptor, who was a big inspiration for me about which I'll speak about a little bit more in a second. So if you look at the fence and you get to the entrance of the building, here's the entrance. Behind this outer fence, there was another inner fence. So inside the building was an atrium, and that atrium had itself a big fence. It was made out of teak, as we heard. It wasn't made out of steel. But why was it in there in the first place? It was a highly symbolic architectural element. A fence, the, the word for, for the building that the embassy sits, the embassy is the people. The building is called a chancery. And the word chancery comes from the Latin cancellus, which really means fence, gates. And so the chancellor is the gatekeeper. The ambassador is the chancellor of the building. He's there to, to open and close the door, open and close the messages, to control the flow of information from one country to another. So the, the embassy has to be guarded and open at the same time. That's why it has to be a fence and not a wall. So the fence seems like a very important symbolic element. And here it is on the inside, chosen by Saarinen as the core symbolic element in this building. And of course, when Harry Bertoya was commissioned to design the sculpture inside the building, he was channeling the fence. And you can see how he's taking the vertical elements around the fence in the interior to make a sculpture. So that's, that was my point of departure. How do we take this fence now, not on the inside, but on the outside, and start to reimagine it, try to rethink it, and try to then move it forward in time. But of course, a fence is a line. Fences live in the world of straight lines. And I was very interested in the idea that you know, a line sets up a confrontation, a, a division, you and me across from a line. So I wanted to think about how do I transform this line into more of a dialogue, more of the idea of diplomacy, more of the back and forth. So as we had to remove the fence, then we began to actually take the whole fence and do a performance with the machinery to actually turn the fence into a volume. So how do you go from a straight line to a volume? How do you twist and turn the fence? How do you transform it, involute the forms, take the lines, and turn them into three dimensions to really begin to explore this notion of the back and forth between us, the going through and around the line, turning a line into a volume. And so all the pieces from the performance then, we, we rented a, uh, a big warehouse outside of Oslo and I spent a summer there. Uh, we put all the pieces around in this yard and then I went around and selected the different pieces of the fence to then reassemble them together and weld them together into the sculptures that you now see on Park Avenue. So that are those, that's, the, that's the process in Oslo, but then uh, we had to then move them all back. Now we hope, of, of, fingers crossed, that one of them will be on the back of the, of the embassy, 
uh, if the city of Oslo uh, so allows. Um, but here you have some of the process of how we then put them together. These are massive, solid steel. This is not your usual fence you can buy at Home Depot. This is this this under the torque, a Home Depot fence would have snapped. This one turned and twisted. And for me, this notion of revealing the materiality of the building through the work itself is very important because saving the history of the material to me is key. And what is the edge? What are the limits of acceptable change when you start losing the fence in the fences, in the fenceness of the fence? And where do you actually save that? So I tried to strike that balance over here. And that and this is where you know the the sculptures now are. Now bringing them to New York was a process, and I was very intentional about uh, where I wanted to place these um, these sculptures. Of course, this was quite a process. Uh, we were invited as a studio to uh, to present these sculptures on Park Avenue by the Fund for Park Avenue in New York City Parks. So we were, you know, very grateful for that. And we were given a choice of where to put these on Park Avenue. And we chose to sit right across the Seagram building and the Lever House, which was very important for us for many reasons. It's on 53rd Street, not, to, not least of which is that right on 53rd Street, down the street is Saarinen's other New York building, the CBS Tower, which was actually inspired by the, uh, 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 by the embassy in Oslo. He flew the CEO of CBS to Norway to show him the embassy as a way to convince him to build this building with the same stone and the same triangulated facades. So very important for us, 1964 on 53rd Street, but also because 50 the Seagram building was such an important laboratory for experimental preservation. Very early on, after Phyllis Lambert designed the building, she decided to put up a temporary sculpture program together with MoMA. Uh, and so some of the early pieces that were shown was, were actually historic pieces of buildings from other places brought there to raise awareness about the need to preserve those historic sites. And it's not by coincidence that this one in particular from Mexico was brought to New York a year after the U.S. Embassy opened in Mexico City. And now, if you remember the 64 date, 65 date, this is just the time in which the CBS Tower is going up down the street. So at this very moment in the mid-1960s, we have both the U.S. Embassy inspiring one building and then Seagram inspiring a new idea about preservation, which went on because a few years later, the International Fund for Monuments, what we now call the World Monuments Fund, was got its start on the Seagram Plaza, wh where they brought the statue, uh, the one of the um, uh, head <clears throat> from Easter Island from Rapa Nui, to uh, and organize this big event to try to raise awareness about the preservation of U uh, of, of Rapa Nui. And the person that organized this was the famous Norwegian explorer who sunk, who was, he didn't sink, he floated across the Pacific on the Kontiki. And so that Kontiki is now back in, in, uh, in Oslo. So he was here uh, organizing this big event to try to preserve Easter Island. So this is why we brought this piece of architecture from Oslo to try to raise awareness about the importance of preserving these U.S. embassies this network of U.S. embassies from around the world. And so on 53rd Street, you see one of them. And further up the street on 66 and 67, in front of the Park Avenue Armory, uh, another building that is a wink and a nod to Paul Byard because uh, Platt Byard, DeVell White, and actually Deborah Barrows here worked on this project. They actually restored this, this building, but they turned a military building into a culture house. They turned it from so hard power into soft power. And for me, that's a really interesting and important mode of thinking about these U.S. embassies and part of what we were able to see in the Oslo embassy, but also what could be done with all the other embassies. And it's a very important side because one of the think tanks, the most important policy think tanks in the United States sits right across from the Park Avenue uh, Armory, the Council on Foreign Relations. So Park Avenue has been a laboratory for experimental preservation, but also a laboratory for diplomacy. And so we're very proud to have been able to put these, build, these uh, p 
pieces of buildings on Park Avenue as a way to preserve uh, both the fence, but also to raise awareness about this larger uh, system of embassies. Now, architects, the site is, the, the project is called Analog Sites. The whole exhibition is called Analog Sites. And we were very interested in the fact that architects don't build, they draw, and diplomats don't actually build fences. They, they imagine them through treaties and, and, and dialogue. And so I went back to all the treaties signed between the United States and Norway and reimagined them, tried to create a new kind of imagination, diplomatic imagination, by taking the lines of the treaties, which are also, you know, the text of these treaties live in straight lines. They seem to make things very logical. Uh, and to reimagine these straight lines into their, uh, into a turning, uh, into a turning line, into a line that moves back and forth, that reflects more clearly this idea of negotiation, of of dialogue, of um, of diplomacy, in fact. And so each of the sculptures actually pulls its name quite literally from the text. And so here you have analog sites on the lower side, outer space. These are all the names of the sculptures come from the treaties themselves. They're literally pulled out of the text of the treaties. And so um, I made this series of prints that are all the treaties uh, between the United States and Norway. They, um, they become these papers, these, these uh, limited edition prints. This is treaty number 10 in which you have analog sites as part of it. This is a treaty that the United States and Norway have signed for the exploration of outer space. And part of that treaty involves using places in the United States and Norway as analog sites for the exploration of outer space. And so I'm very interested in this idea that a place could be used to explore ideas that we cannot do somewhere else in the same way that we can explore preservation on Park Avenue that we couldn't do somewhere else in the world. So these treaties have now, uh, is very, for me it was very important, these are single treaties, but they are folded twice. They're fold, each piece of paper is folded twice, and it is, as it's folded twice, put into an artist's book. And each treaty is folded twice because uh, diplomacy is actually the art of the diploma. And a diploma simply means a piece of paper that's folded twice. D is like dioxide, it's two, it's two folds of a piece of paper. So the diploma is the letters that were given to uh, diplomats as they're um, uh, th giving them the authority to be representatives of one country abroad. So the, the art of the diploma is the art of the folded papers. What you do with the folded paper, that matters. So all the folded papers then become, the, all the treaties, all the sculptures are contained both inside this artist's book, which has a plan of the U.S. Embassy in it on a plinth. And in this reflected mirror are all the names of the sculptures. So all, instead of the original names of the, of the, of the rooms, they've all been replaced with the names of the sculptures. And so with a, when you take a piece of paper and you fold it twice, you get a triangle, which is, of course, the, the plan of the U.S. Embassy is a triangle. So in fact, the, the diplomas become little models of the U.S. Embassy in Norway. And they are also two sides. The diploma has two sides, front and back. So they're printed forwards and backwards. So if you look inside the diploma, um, these prints are actually printed backwards. But when you look inside of the mirror, then you can read them. So there's a kind of secret language here of diplomacy happening. But when these texts line up with the text on the, on the, uh, on the mirror, that's the, that's the name of that sculpture. So there's a kind of coded message here of the, of the whole process. So all of that becomes part of an artist book, which I've called Treaties on Defenses, obviously with a play of words. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and uh, for uh, this is the, the, one of the longest uh, <laughs> Bayard lectures uh, ever, but I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you.